sounds the beginning of a new podcast episode. I hope you're excited. I know I'm excited. You, I'm, Anthony is excited. We're both excited. Now, I actually wanted to start with something a little bit different. So what, if, if you're listening to this, I'd like for you to please close your eyes. Unless you're driving. I don't know. I wonder, do you think, okay, yeah, if you're driving, pull over immediately and close your eyes. You're asking for a lot right now. I want to get you, Tony, can you stop that, please? I'm sorry. I want, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> I want the listener, you, our faithful listener, to get to a very calm place, and I want to get you thinking about reptiles, about turtles, and even amphibians, frogs, salamanders. So here we are. We're, we're, in, we're in an aerial view in a helicopter right now. We're slowly diving into the pond. Can you get us closer? You're starting to see the forms of the trees. You're starting to see the water on the floor of the, of the pond, of the bog even. Maybe think more boggy. And now we're coming up. There's a little bit of a landmass. We're evening out. We're evening out. Picture like, I've, like maybe like a dragonfly. Like you have the viewpoint of a dragonfly flying into the pond. Hope you feel very calm. There's a landmass, and there's a small frog, medium frog. We'll call it a medium frog. He is playing the banjo, and you're just really digging it. He's not wearing any clothes because he's a frog. But he's just strumming on the banjo, and you just get a good vibe from him. I hope we're all in a good place now. That, of course, was the the, the beginning of uh, of the Muppets Take Manhattan. I don't. Did that, Tony? Did you catch that? No, I didn't. I didn't. Okay. But I got the good vibe, though. I definitely. Might have been, you, know what, you know what? That's that's a lie. It's the Muppet, the Muppet movie. You don't even know which Muppet movie it is. I. You know, it's it's the. I get so mad at myself when I mix up Muppets, Muppet movies, but. Anyway, I hope you're feeling good. Um, and we actually, Tony and I, we have a we have a really we have a very special guest. This is our first guest on the uh, on the podcast. So we're gonna we're like introduce him now. Tony, you want to do that? We are wicked excited about this. Oh, you don't even know how many strings we had to pull to get him here. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. <laughs> he's pretty. He's he's kind of a big deal. He's even a big deal than a bigger deal than the uh, pantsless frog that John was telling you about. So we're pretty excited. Um, we have with us today um, Stephen Enders, the founder of the Turtle Room. Um, so he's really knowledgeable on a lot of uh, important topics, and uh, he's a good friend. So we're excited to have him. Say hello, Steve. Wow, you. Uh, hey, wow, you fool named me. Uh, it makes me feel really good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> how how do you feel, by the way, about I, I keep thinking of you when I see Enders game. Oh, the, I, want, I wanted movie. to say something about that to him. I wanted to. I'm happy you brought that up. Yeah. Do you, are, you have any relation to Ender Wigan? Is that what you're? Uh, no. As as far as I know, I do not. And, you know, especially since he's, I think, a fictional character. But you know, um, I, I've never read that book actually. So You've never read Ender's Game. No. No. Come well, on, Steve. You're a nerd like me. We we we've, we've all read Ender's Game. You can admit it. Admit it to the internet, please. <laughs> <laughs> I only wish I could. Okay. Well, here's the deal. I don't I don't read any books about anything other than reptiles, so why don't you guys, one of you read it and let me know how it is. I've read it. Oh, okay. Well, then and there is they do name drop lizard and dragon. This part the names of the are of two of the armies. It's not bad. Dragon army. Interesting. Led by Ender. All right. I'm, I'm I have a feeling that you guys don't care about this. So bingo. Um, <laughs> awesome. Uh, so, Steve, we're very excited to have you. Well, I'm I'm glad to be here again. Or, well, again. What do I mean again? This is the first time. But I'm glad to be here. Uh, I think what he's trying he's trying to lead to do, there will be multiple appearances. Steve may become one of these regular. Like, who, who was the guy in the Tom Green show that just stood in the back with the coffee mug? I can't remember his name, but I think about him all <laughs> the time. Is it Glenn? It, it was Glenn? Glenn. It was Glenn. It was and Glenn, he just, yeah. He stood there with the mug, and he just laughed at everything that he said. Right. So, and Steve is Steve is a pretty easy laugh. So he might have to be our Glenn. Okay. But, uh, uh, that's kind of sad, hey, though. I, Steve is a lot smarter than we are. Well, Glenn was probably smarter than Tom Green too. But 
Do you know who was smarter than Tom Green? Everybody. Everyone. The coffee cup? Everybody. <laughs> yes, exactly. Classic. <laughs> Classic. I hate. I mean, I don't want to kick Tom Green while he's down, but um, <laughs> but I don't. I don't think that he was too soon. Is it too soon to make fun of Tom Green? Why is he dead? No, no. Oh. I'm just saying, he's been. Oh, just his career. Yes, right. He's oh. been ir- irrelevant for quite quite some time. I think. Uh, I believe ever since uh, my bum is on your lips, about around that. <laughs> That's what ended it for him. That was his last relevancy, and that was—I mean—you kind of go out with a with a bang when you do that that sort of a song, right? Um, so, Steve, uh, we have a few actually news stories because it's been it's been quite some time. Um, so we have a couple things to catch up on. Tony, you want to take that uh, take that away? Yes, yeah. Um, one uh, story that I thought was really interesting was um, something new uh, involving uh, a partnership that was formed to improve the Python trade. Now, the literature that I read on it was um, kind of a little vague, but I thought what was really cool was that um, certain organizations um, within this Python conservation partnership um, are are also partnering with um, Gucci, like the fashion brand. Um, like Keep It Gucci, yo? Yeah, yeah. I've never heard that, but yeah, I'd assume that that's what people would say about Gucci. I, I, I never heard that either. Actually, this is uh, one of my um, one of my players was told me that he was after a test. I asked him how he did on his test, and he said he he kept it Gucci. And I I was nice. I asked him if that meant good, and he nice. said, "Yeah, sorry that's for, a new one for sorry me for too. the yeah." He apologized for using trap talk, and I I also just assumed that that was um. Another thing that I didn't know what it meant. Oh, how do we fall so far from from it relevancy? Ha- it happened fast. It does. The the the, the, the lingo is yeah. just the slang. I know. You know how far we've fallen. I just referred to it as lingo. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> ain't that the truth, man? That is. Yeah, I fat. spend. You know, I spent most of my days with college age kids right now, and I don't understand half the things they're saying. Man. No, of course not. We're not that old. And, and then, you know, yeah. Especially no, compared to them. And you're, the you're, at kids work. Too? you're at work and they're at twerk. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the major difference is. <laughs> we should, I, I thought you said one of your players, John, I think we should probably tell the viewers that you, are, um, that you are coaching basketball at the collegiate level. Is that something I can say? I, I, well, you did, so yes. I'm, I, uh, <laughs> I can edit it out. I wear a lot of, no, I don't care. I wear, I wear many hats. Yes, you do. You have a collection that's, of hats. That's all, I have to say. that's all I have to say about that. I just Good. wear a lot of hats. One of them is college basketball coach. That's great. And uh, last week you had a pretty interesting uh, a pretty interesting game. We, we did. We did. I coach at, at Iona College, and we played um, We played against the University of Kansas at the University of Kansas. And oh, we, yeah. played, we gave him a pretty good game, actually. Yeah, it was and, great. Yeah, you I, I think definitely um, did. the back of my head was visible, correct? Yes. Uh, yeah. For all, the entire first half, at least. Yeah, on the on the television, so. I actually outlasted Steve for once. I, I normally fall asleep, like, at 7 p.m. Yeah, you're an early. Yeah, you're yeah, an early. Yeah, it's really bad. But um, I actually outlasted <laughs> Steve, and I um, once um, Kansas kind of pulled away a little bit, they they had, a like, a 10-second shot of your face on the bench. I was really excited about it. It's not every day you get to watch ESPN and see your um, turtle nerd friend sitting on the bench uh, in the middle of Fog Allen Fieldhouse with 100,000 smurf looking people who are painted blue so it's pretty cool yeah i appreciate the um the support absolutely thank you for uh for watching how did you think my hair looked good i didn't think you, you had see, much yes hair. or no yes Ooh, it's ouch. it's hard to mess up your hair your hair john it's it's such a you know classic it's style it just, it it just can't get messed up it i didn't is, think, I, I wasn't saying you're bald i'm just saying you're close cut that's all well see this is this is the thing i'm feeling a little self-conscious because i'm I was watching a, a. I was the back of my head was in a different film, and I thought I saw a little bit of lightness going on in the back. Like I was, I was. Um, I'm, I'm starting to lose the old uh, the fullness. That's how it always happens because you're looking at the. Hair, I know you're looking straight on, and the hairs are pointed at you, so you don't right. get the. Right. Well, color. but no one's. But no one usually sees my head, so just and I yeah. usually don't see my head, so just seeing it, it right. was. Uh, it gave me. It gave me a bit of the of the of the jimmies. John's a couple of inches short of seven feet tall, so. Yes. Many people see the top of his head. I totally understand. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, continue on. I hate to anyways you right now, but I'm going to. So anyways. Anyways, um, keep a Gucci, dog. I will. I will keep a Gucci. So <laughs> I thought this was pretty cool. Um, 
this news story about the um, collaboration between the private sector, um, NGOs, IGOs, and government a- governmental agencies, um, basically to try to save pythons and kind of clean up the python trade i thought it was kind of cool because um it's not something that we see a lot and then that kind of got me thinking about what we had been talking about um related to like repurposing of technology or just new ways of doing things and like how we like to brainstorm and and daydream about conservation and what we would do sort of thing so i thought it was a really cool thing something maybe in in between what's rational and what should happen or if we could do it sort of thing sure yeah. What um we actually we're going to start a, a tradition now, Steve. We want to ask uh, each of our each of our visitors, our guests, to um to possibly uh, attribute or con- excuse me contribute um uh, a new a new repurposing of technology for the environmental sector. Um, so if you want to think of one of those, let us know when you when you have a good one, or do you have a good one? Uh, I don't have a good one yet. It's certainly a challenging question for, for yeah. sure. Thank you. Um, That's what I say to him all the time. No, it is. No, I know it is. That's why I want to ask it. That's why, you know what I mean? Because this is, again, I like, my, go, go ahead. I, I like challenging questions. I think it's yeah. part of uh, part of the purpose of being here is to think about those things. But Steve, right. does he have to be so pushy? Oh. Honestly, does he have to be? I, I thought I was on, <laughs> on, a, on a scale of 1 to 15. I thought I was about a 7 and a pushy. That was not even a half. Yeah, well, you you just... Set a scale of one to fifteen. Who even says that? The pushy person. That's who. Doesn't even make sense. <laughs> that's that's so they can still be a seven and still be below half. Yeah, right. that's why I did it. That's why I did it. Right. <laughs> You're a seven, all right. And there's a scale of one to eight. How do you like that? Oh boy. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, I anyways let's keep, let's keep it Gucci. <laughs> um, are you done with that? Are there's you, the word that? of the day, folks. Yes. It is. It, the, the, the best part about it is it can be used for almost anything. What you guys don't know is that I'm wearing a Gucci belt buckle right now. It's you probably a, are. It's one of the spinner ones. If you, you could spin the, the buckle, it's it's chrome. It's really cool. Got you see, you, I, you're, you're trying to now play it off like you were joking, but you are. Your wife's a fashionista. You definitely are. I am. You, you're wearing a nice something nice. I'm just kidding. My belt buckle is Dolce & Gabbana. Hello. Let's be honest. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Absolutely. As if we would never wear a bell buckle from those dirt bags at Gucci, right? Well, don't say that they're they're helping pythons. Which the the one thing that I do want to say about that story too is there's so many different hands in the pot. Do you get what I'm saying? There's so many different like agendas involved that I don't know how it could work. But that's just like my first thought. I'm obviously I'm not involved. I don't understand. But what that. are the what, what agendas? What do you mean? Who who, how who could, would have a different agenda? How could Gucci really care the same way about the situation that the um, the poor villager does that needs to support his family? And how could they care the same way the wildlife um, officer cares? And how could they care the same way that the the Python fanatic cares? Make sense? Well, yes, but I mean they're all, they're all interconnected. That's what I, that's what it is. I think that's that's the point of. Or what I liked about this thing is that I think it's you're reaching into a bunch of different worlds that are that have some similar interests. I don't think they have similar interests, though. Is my point? It's kind of like they're all connected, like like in the movie Traffic, like they're all connected to one another. But they, I don't think they have. They're all connected by the Python trade, but I don't think they have the same. So you don't buy the corporations are people argument? Is what you're saying? I don't buy the these four or five or six different people all having the same outlook and the same goals. I don't I don't and that's the the article and everything I've read on it about this partnership doesn't explain that side of it and I'm sure if I heard it explained it might make sense like okay I see how you know everyone could benefit from this and that's why they're involved but maybe one place wants to look good and another place really wants to save the snakes and another place Wants to be able to continue making money. I get right. that, but, but, but if it you just look, doesn't if, talk about if, that. If Gucci, if Gucci wants to look good, so they give money towards this research, then good for them. I don't care what their intentions are. Yeah, unless it's to I, make yeah, snakeskin belt buckles. Yep, I agree with that. Totally. Uh, it might be more likely for the belt than the buckle, but you know, right? That's, that's a good point. <laughs> because not, your snakeskin belt buckles aren't very common. They're not in. But I'm saving all of mine in case they come back around. <laughs> <laughs> um, keep it Gucci, is, yo. Keep it Gucci. There, that was that was a really Gucci. Yeah. Um, that was a really Gucci section of the of the news. 
Definitely. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to bring up real quick that there has been a veritable lost world of new species discovered in far north Queensland, Australia. Isn't that nice? That's awesome. It's good to have, you know, it's good to remind ourselves that there's still stuff that we don't know about. And um, the thing, there was, it was three new species were discovered, a leaf-tailed gecko, which is really cool looking. You should check it out. Um, the, the article is on The Guardian uh, if you search if you search for veritable lost world of new species, it'll come up. Um, they also found a golden colored skink and a boulder dwelling frog. Um, boulder just, dwelling. It, it, yeah. Bold, Cause I guess, so the area is like really, is really rocky. So like people don't even really go in it because there's nothing you can, you know, there's no, it's like, it's miles and miles and miles of just large boulders. Mm-hmm. So like people can't even really safely move around in them, let alone, settle or, or anything like that so they're they're relatively unexplored so it's really interesting yeah it, it's just weird that it, it's 2013 and there's still places besides the ocean even that we haven't really explored right i mean hello it's like 2005 right yeah this, that, that's what i felt like when i read this article i was like what is this 2005 <laughs> 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 that's really cool though yeah you get check out definitely if you're listening and not driving, check out the picture of the leaf tail gecko specifically. It's really uh you know in in my long documented history of loving animals that look like leaves, it's right up there. Can we uh Steve, when we put this on um the Turtle Room uh website, can we put a can we steal a picture of a leaf tail gecko or is that um some kind of copyright infringement? I could look one, look for one that's um, that's posted under uh, a particular Creative Commons license, which would allow us to use it. Sweet. See, if, for anyone who's listening, well, there's you, only this this specific thing has only had one picture taken of it in its whole existence because we just found out about it. So I don't know if we're going to be able to, to find that. But all right. So well, there's probably more than one leaf-tailed gecko. So even if we don't get that leaf-tailed, we gecko, can do a we'll probably get yeah. a, all leaf-tailed, leaf-tailed geckos tailed. look alike. Let's get. I'm just kidding. I almost, you almost, I almost hit you. I almost hit you. <laughs> you can't hit me. All leaf-tailed geckos look like. You're in a different state. I was just kidding. It was a joke because I'm a turtle person. You know what I mean? It was just a joke. I'm totally, anyone out there who loves leaf-tailed geckos, I'm so sorry. They're wonderful. All geckos are wonderful. Um, yeah, sorry about that. I'm, I'm, I'm not amused. Well, you're pushy and I'm not amused about that. So for anyone who's listening, what I was trying to say before John really interrupted me was um, about a minute and a half ago. Uh, Steve is kind of, well, he created the Turtle Room and all of the awesome, up-to-date, important, relevant information that's on that website comes primarily from him. And all of it gets put on there by him as well. So um, that's why I asked him uh, what his you know, what his thoughts would be on that because he's usually behind the scenes on that and he works on a lot of cool stuff. Um, one of the cool things that he's done as well is he's been really involved in stud books. So, John, is it cool with you if we go into that? Yeah, oh yeah. Please. Okay, cool. Yeah, so he's done a lot uh, recently on, on stud books. He, he actually, uh, well, Steve, do you want to tell us what you just did recently? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, Chris Leone of... Uh... Uh, Garden State Tortoise, uh, he uh, approached me uh, ooh, about two months ago now, three months ago, something like that, um, about creating a stud book for the Western's, Western Hermans Tortoise, which is a uh, relatively rare uh, tortoise species, uh, especially in cap- captivity here in the United States. Um, they're now listed as, I think, uh, threatened in the wild. Um, the other subspecies is quite common. So because of that, the um, AZA, which runs most of the stud, most, if not all the stud books in the United States, um, they don't really focus on that species because uh, the the pet trade specimens are, are muddled between the two spe- subspecies or they're mostly Eastern. And so it's hard to get Westerns here now that they're listed as um, sites appendix two. So Chris took a lot of time and money and effort uh, at, legally obtaining a number of, of these tortoises from five different localities in their natural range. And 
So as, as a way to maintain their uh, genetics and to track all the offspring, he wanted to get involved with a, a stud book for them. So we went and searched and we found out, you know, what I just mentioned, that the AZA wasn't really uh, doing anything with them, wasn't involved, and didn't run to really get into them, which is fine because there's lots of species that need need assistance and that their resources would be better able to help because there are more specimens of them to work with. So um, I took uh, some of the uh, stud books and species survival plans that we're already involved with and used them as kind of a guide to help uh, design and create uh, this new stud book for the Western Hermans tortoise. Um, I, I, I published it and edited it and kind of guided Chris. He did most of the actual uh, writing of it. But I, I kind of just uh, gave him that springboard to be able to do that and make the project happen for uh, the way he kind of hoped it would happen. Yeah, so it's... it was a really great partnership, and he was really excited by the final outcome of that book. The idea is to publish an update, hopefully every year, that will include uh, the new offspring and you know where they've been transferred to as well. Great information. That's great. And I, I know we're really excited to be involved as well. And obviously you've done um, the work from our end, the turtle room end, but it's, it's obviously a really exciting development. That's really cool. And Chris is a really good guy and um, he's got some awesome stuff going on. So that's awesome. Definitely. So how, how, it was I, nice to actually ask... meet person the other month. Sorry. Sorry about that. No, no. Can I, I just, I was curious as to how, where, where did this idea to get the specific stud book for this? Well, why this species? Is it that it, was there a specific reason that you wanted the hermits because they didn't have one yet, or how did it come? Um, up? It, well, it, it's a passion species for Chris. Uh, the Western Hermans is probably the, his top project. Um, it, it's the one that he he focuses on mostly. Um, he's already. Uh, investing money, uh, fi- helping to finance uh, a nonprofit in Europe that kind of helps with uh, ex situ conservation as well. And so this was kind of just another another aspect of Western's Herman's conservation that Chris could get into. And he just wasn't sure about how to make it happen. So um, he had asked somebody else about it, that somebody else said, hey, talk to Steve. And um, I had already dealt with Chris before, but so it kind of formed just a stronger partnership there. Uh, and we just made it happen at that point. And it has to take it's, – awesome. it's, it takes a bunch of different factors to all be lined up perfectly. You know, it's Chris's interest in, in this subspecies. It's also the fact that it is a subspecies, that it's not – you know, it, like Steve said, that the the gene pool here is questionable to the um, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And, you know, all of that stuff together and then also Steve's skills and, and interest in, in the um, species survival programs kind of all made it happen. It, it wouldn't really work with just, you couldn't just really go out and do it with just any species that you happen to like, because if it, the chances are, if it needs a stud book or species survival program, then it probably has it already. Right. And this one, just because of the circumstances, didn't have one yet. So it really worked out perfectly. It's, this is what I get out of bed in the morning for is to hear about <laughs> stuff like this. Yeah, and frankly, you know, I enjoy just as much uh, kind of helping somebody else reach the goal that they wanted to get to as, as much as anything else. So it was really enjoyable just to help Chris uh, make something happen that he wanted to wanted to happen. So, right. where does all the information come from? Seeing as how, I mean, especially I'm looking at the stub book right now, and most of these are, I mean, it's an Italian. Uh, it's an Italian species, and a lot of them are located there. Where? How does that? Is it uh, internet stuff, or how does that information come together? Um, well, he had he he's imported all the specimens that are in the stud book, and they're native to those particular regions of Italy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he, he he's kind of an expert on the species as well. He's done a lot of reading and research on them, and so the other information in the stud book. Uh, on the background of the species was uh, just written by Chris from his per- personal knowledge database from doing all this research and and knowing the species this well. He's uh, okay. one of one of only a, a handful of people in the United States that even has this subspecies in, in possession. Um, much less has forty five of them, uh, right. and most of them don't have legal proof or mm-hmm. that they are that subspecies or, or the 
they may not even be necessary. If they are definitely Westerns, they may not be legal Westerns, which kind of limits what can happen with them conservation wise speaking. Right. Because they're kind of, you know, kept on the down low. It's really the only way you could do it is to have them imported because of the fact that I mean, otherwise you'd, I mean, could you even do like genetic testing on animals that you wanted to put into the stud book from this point? I don't know if you could the same way like that, um, that you would do with like the spider tortoises with, with their subspecies. I would assume you might be you able could, to, but that seems like you could, but a lot of work. Yeah, extra cost, extra yeah. cost for sure. Um, and that's that's why when you're talking about most of the stud books, they try to keep um, keep only one male in with with a couple females or even just one female. Um, but they don't like more than one male in a breeding setup because then they have to guess where parentage lies, and the parentage is important for tracking the genetics uh, and so e- even the you know even the aza and etc they try to save money on doing genetic testing by knowing where the parentage is so they can track the genetics that way right so can you tell us um what other species um that uh the turtle room participants are involved in that that you're you know yeah um, our group's members are other stud in? books you mean? yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Um, there are, let me think, there are five other uh, stud books that the Turtle Room is involved with, all uh, with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Um, and in each one of these cases, is, uh, our animals are also listed in the Species Survival Plan. Uh, the AZA calls those SSPs. Um, the Ben has uh, animals in the uh, Minoria Emmys Emmys uh, book, which is uh, the um, one of the uh, giant Asian tortoises. Um, Ben's other uh, book that he's involved in is uh, Indotestudo Forstenii. He was actually the original uh, writer and keeper of that book when he, he uh, worked for the Memphis Zoo uh, back in the day. And he keeps uh, about a third of the specimens that are involved in that program are under his care. That's the fourth um, tortoise, right? Yes. Yes, this Forston's tortoise, uh, sometimes known as the Sulawesi forest tortoise as well. I Actually, that's, by both that's a great name. Yes. The, the, big, um, that, that fem- the big beautiful female that I found on Craigslist, and I'm, I'm not talking yeah, yeah. about a date. I'm talking about the tortoise, the, the Forston's tortoise. Um, just, ben just picked it up uh, last week, picked her up last week, and said she's, she's looking good. So I'm pretty excited about that. Just wanted to say that. You found that a BBW for on, the, on the Internet? What's that? You found a BBW on the internet? Yeah. Good man. Yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> wow. So, please, wow. Steve, continue. What else? What else? Yeah, what, what are the other species? Okay. Uh, yes, uh, moving on. Um, Anthony keeps uh, Pixies, Arachnoides, Arachnoides, the common spider tortoise. He's involved in uh, that stud book in SSP. That one's run by uh, Knoxville Zoo's uh, Michael Ogle. Um and then Anthony and I together have a joint Geomita Spangleri project, which is the Vietnamese black-breasted leaf turtle. That book is headed up uh, by uh, Rick Hefner out at Denver Zoo. Um, and then lastly, uh, my ringed map turtles, Graptomus oculifera, will be in the upcoming uh, stud book for that species, which is headed um, by uh, Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium out in Omaha, Nebraska. That's great. Uh, that that's those five, and also recently, not a stud book, but uh, a similar program. Anthony has uh, gotten involved with uh, the TSA's Cora Flava Marginata, the uh, Chinese Yellow Margin Box Turtle uh, Management Program, as well. And it's it's similar to some of the stud book programs. With uh, this program, I believe has a target to rele- eventually release. Uh, a large n- number of specimens that have uh, good genetic diversity back into the wild where they uh, originally are native. Which is like the best thing you could ever do as far as like captive breeding and the conservation side of it. So I, it's really refreshing. Yeah, I really hope that can happen. Well, let me yeah, ask you it, this though. Let me ask you this. If, if you were able to do that and release, I mean, is the, are we beating our heads against the wall? By releasing them into an area that they've already been, uh, you know, reasonably eliminated from? The short answer uh, is absolutely. Right. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Just yes, sure. Yes and no. Right. Uh, I, I, yes and no. I, I think if you were releasing a couple specimens a year, 
you, that's more likely to to bang your head against the wall because so what kind of numbers are we talking about? Stand... What was that? What kind of numbers are we talking that we you know? Uh, is, we're, is we're talking deal? we're talking releasing hundreds at, uh, hundreds at a time. And you would right, only right. do so um, into it, areas that are that you're sure are now protected. So you would you know into a wildlife right. sanctuary or something like that to start to get them going again. And then right. hope for, uh, you know, better law enforcement and things like that down the line. But you wouldn't just throw them back into the same spot that they were plucked from two months ago for, right. for the food trade. You know what I mean? Right. Right. From, from the way I understand the entire process, there's a scouting of a region that needs to happen um, to make sure that the habitat is acceptable because the habitat they may have been removed from. Part of the reason they may not live there anymore is it's not a good habitat anymore. So you need to identify a habitat, need to make sure it's protected, and then you need to release large numbers. If you release just a couple, uh, you know, they can get picked off by predators, by poachers, by an anything really. Um, but the large numbers make success a little more plausible, a little more possible. And that's why it takes time to develop a, a solid genetic uh, base of hundreds of animals that can be released. So it, it's a time-consuming project, especially with the reproductive cycle of turtles. Right, right. I th what I thought was pretty cool. I was reading um, in the Tortoise recently, uh, the Turtle Conservancy's um, yearly publication, that they released um, golden coin box turtles back into the wild, which was just really cool to see. But interestingly, now that you say that, um, it didn't really because in in my mind, I said, "Well, that's great." You know, they're releasing them back there. I never heard of that before. I only heard of it once before with. Um, with the Vietnamese leaf turtle, uh, on pond turtle, I mean, uh, the uh, Maremis and anemsis. So it was really cool to hear that. But I think they only brought like five specimens over. So, I mean, who knows? You know, I've caught three turtles in one scoop before. Actually, my wife has too. So, you know, it's one scoop of a net at the pond, you know. So um, who knows what could happen, especially with how many animals, you know, get hit on the roads and taken by predators like you're saying so right yeah you're such a cynic no i'm just asking the question it's the, it's the something that i I've, i'm assuming that our listeners will be like but wait a minute they just got it's eaten a, out there <laughs> right it's a, it's a legitimate question it's yeah. like the uh it's like the the story about the boy walking across the beach throwing starfish in one at a time right oh, in some yeah, ways yeah. you know so it's like how one. much are you really doing right yeah. so it's legitimate it, it's definitely a legitimate question to be asked. I love that story when he throws the starfish out and he throws it into the ocean and a shark jumps up and catches it out of the air. I've never Water. heard that version of the story. That's how they tell it down south. <clears throat> Do sharks eat starfish? Or, or at Halloween. You've, yeah, there you go. You, you've never seen a shark eat a starfish? Come on. You call yourself an animal guy? What kind of shark? I'm a nurse shark. I don't know. Tone, obviously, I'm, I'm just spitballing here. I I watch a lot of Shark Week every year. My wife won't let me miss it. It's her favorite. It's her favorite holiday. Shark she, Week. She she always says you should live every week like it's Shark Week. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So I mean, I've never seen any sharks eat starfish. Maybe those maybe maybe those clips aren't vicious enough to make it to shark week maybe those yeah no out. yeah shark week they got you like they, they want to have you pictures of sharks eating like millions of pounds of blubber off like a dead right whale but i mean i saw that i've seen it, that one about 10 years in a row yeah. yeah and the guys are like standing on the dead whale right yeah um i wouldn't do that. you have to watch you have to watch like a one of the asian shark weeks because they have a <laughs> oh, lot okay that's obviously what you've been watching. Okay. Their attention spans are better than ours, so they can watch them eat starfish. Right. And, and if, if you do that, then you'll get my joke. You have to do all that first. I will. That sounds good. What else did you – do you have anything else that you wanted to uh, to go over with the, the stud books, Steve? Because this is really – I mean, this is great stuff. And I, I, I actually do – I have a question if, if you'll – if I can – I'm raising my hand. I don't know if you can see yeah, feel free, man. Um, all right, so <laughs> my name is uh, is John Smith um, from America, and I have uh, a beautiful uh, turtle here. Um, I don't, you know, I'll be, I'll be gosh darned if I know what kind it is. Um, but I, I bought it from a nice gentleman outside of the barber shop, and um, I wanted to, to get him into a stud book. What do I, what do I have to do? In the uh, in the U.S., that's a bit harder than it would be uh, than say in in Europe. Uh, 
for a number of reasons, but obviously the first step would be to uh, to figure out what species it is and whether it needed to be in one. Um, its name is Mars. US... Does that mean anything? No, that wouldn't be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have? What I mean, I get to when I put it in the stud book, I get to put the name in, though, right? Like this isn't a this isn't a strictly scientific thing. If I if because I have one named Marbles and I have one named Judy, and I wouldn't want them to be referred to as something else. Mr. Smith, if I could just say, Mr. Smith, really quickly. Please. You are not the right person for a stud book. I that would be the next concern. Shocked and offended. <laughs> I, you know, how, you know how, many, how many times that I've put food in, that, in that, the bowl that I keep it in? Right. It yeah, doesn't sound like you're the right person for this. But they have yeah. like they're they're cute though. Like they swim and they're like turtles. They have like little red things on their head. Yeah, there's no stud book for those. No, um, the, there's only stud books for rare species that need it, and and um, a lot of the keepers are. It's, a little self righteous, I think. Right? It's, a, it's the exception it. to the rule to have someone like Steve and Chris to put a stud book together. Like he said, it's because basically the AZA didn't want to do that one, um, so they they can do it. But but um, the zoos and aquariums that have stud books that they um, that they keep are can can a lot of times be hesitant to work with the private sector, which is. Which is rough because a lot of good things happen in um, private collections. So they're just selective because, um, I mean, for a lot of different reasons. I, mean, I can't tell you how many friends we've had in the hobby that have just disappeared or sold off other animals quickly. Um, and sometimes it's it can be tough to communicate between those institutions and, and private individuals. Does that make sense? That's Yeah. That's that's the biggest issue that the AZA has uh, when it comes to dealing with private folks in the stud book. Once you get in and kind of show that you're going to maintain communication and be a valuable member, it's easier to get involved in others as well. Um, so and I, I kind of alluded to the fact that in some ways it's easier in, in Europe. Europe has a uh, has a, a foundation called the European Stud Book Foundation, which – just about any quality keeper can list their animals in, in the stud book within the European Stud Book Foundation. Um, it is a private sector stud book separate from the European Zoo uh, stud books. And so, it, like, and that's kind of why I said what I did uh, in referring to it'd be a little bit easier in Europe because they have an organization that specifically maintains stud books for private keepers to register their animals in. And it's not a bad. That's not a bad thing at all. It, they probably ha just have to deal with a lot more babysitting with the private keepers than probably people would want to do. I don't know if that's like a whole uh, so how yeah. I would, how come there isn't a private sector stud book in um, in America? Can we can we do that? I, I I wouldn't see why it could. I don't see why it couldn't happen. It would take an organization willing to put in the time and the effort. An organization like to, the turtle, <laughs> the turtle room. Um, Let's do it, guys. I'm I'm, a, I'm I'm down. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not down. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't quite have the, the time to pull that off. Um, Just for all those listeners out there, we we basically had like a one hour window in the next like month and a half to get John on Skype to do this recording. So, Oh, make me sound knows. like such a prima donna. You are, you were just sitting on the bench at Fog Allen Fieldhouse in Kansas. Like mm. you're a little busy. We're all a little busy. Well, more are you guys than I, but. Oh, you're busy. We're not starting any <laughs> stud books. So I, I'm, I'm just, it's, I get you. I get it. I'm just saying. That's it. You'd need basically you need a lot of people willing to help run them and organize them, and you'd need to train those people as well, which is a, a big part of the process, I would imagine. Um, I think it could happen eventually. It's just not a, at least for me, it's not a realistic goal at this point. Um, and at some point, though, I I don't know what the value in it would be if there's already an existing one with the AZA. It might be more worth trying to find a way to um, join forces. That way you have a, a deeper gene pool in one area so that you can continue that genetic diversity. Right. Right. Okay. That's good stuff. Your knowledge is 
vast, my friend. I, I, I just, this kind of moving on, if we have anything else that we, you know, that you really want to say about stud books, I, I did want to just ask about some of the other, um, other projects that the Eternal Room is undertaking at this point. Do we? Other projects. Yeah, or um, anything, whatever the, the breeding projects, I think that I, I'm, I'd like to hear about. I think there's, there's probably other one, there's probably one other, um, project that we have coming up uh for the new year um that steve could tell you about that we will have available to um to our listeners and and to our fans and um those that keep it gucci um by going to the turtle room um if you want to talk about that steve we could wrap up with that listen up gucci keepers Um, (laughs) well we'll see if i have the one you're talking about we will be adding uh, a couple breeders uh, in the beginning of the year. So uh, be looking for that. They've got some cool projects that they're working with. And lastly, we have um, a calendar that we've produced. It includes uh, 18 high-resolution images uh, brought to you by the breeders of the Turtle Room uh, and their animals. Uh, Many of them are more rare animals. There are some more common things in there, but not a whole lot. Um, and proceeds basically go to help uh, maintain the, the website and help keep these resources coming to you, the listeners, and the website viewers. That's awesome. awesome. And Yeah. Um, I know John hasn't seen it yet in person, but I have, and the calendar is really, really sharp. The, the photos are beautiful, and, you know, the, the printing and the quality, the pro, you know, the production value or whatever you want to call it is, is really, really, really awesome. It's, it's really top-notch. So Steve did a really great job on that, and I'm really proud to be a part of it. So um, they're, and what they're are also they, really Calendars affordable. go for what, about um, 15 20 bucks, 25 bucks for a nice oh. calendar like that? Only seven fifty right now. Oh man, knock my socks off! <laughs> uh, of course, of course, in Pennsylvania, there's there's sales tax on that, so it comes to just, to right around eight dollars. Um, <clears throat> so basically, seven fifty plus shipping, uh, and then in PA, you have to add a little bit extra for the sales tax. But so, uh, if I were a, a lay person looking to uh, to really support a good, you know, a good website that's doing great things, I could spend around eight dollars and uh, get something for me, and also help. Is that what you're saying? Exactly, exactly. Nice. Or you could spend $32 and have something for you and your loved ones for the holidays. Tony, if any of my loved ones listen to this, they're going to know what they're getting. I'm sorry. They probably already knew. You're blowing, blowing up my anyway. spot. No, they definitely thought they were getting nothing. <laughs> for seven fifty, it's a great stocking stuffer, let's be honest. Or it's a great gift, like just standalone. Yeah, of course. Of course. I, I'm just I, any. Yeah, Any turtle important. and tortoise lover should enjoy it, especially with uh, the quality of some of those images. There it is. Well said. So what, what images, I also went, we're talking about like some naked ladies with like some turtles over the the untouchables or what? No, we, we didn't go with anything quite that risque. Um, <laughs> <laughs> some of the species included uh, are the, the ring map turtles, Graptum sacculifera, um, Coro flava marginata. In fact, all six stud books. Book uh, and conservation program species are going to be involved. So that's Minoria emmys emmys, uh, the Coraflava marginata, the Graptomus oculifera, uh, Indotestudo forstenii, Pyxis arachnoides, and Geomitis spengleri. Uh, you'll get their images of all them, plus that's only six. So there's uh, another dozen species involved in the calendar other than them as well. Uh, some really cool things, Nile River soft shells. Uh, are one that oh th- that's actually a, a new new name I don't know that I actually put that one out there for anybody yet so th- there's another preview Nile wow. River soft shell nice so <laughs> name drop another species for everybody cool that's awesome thank you Steve so much for coming on and, and giving us some of your time and and all that um, information um, is really really awesome to have you yeah thanks, my Steve. pleasure uh, I hope it's been fun it's been fun for me so. All right, well, folks. I guess so. so we're gonna um, we're gonna say goodbye to Steve and wrap this up. We hope that you have really uh, enjoyed this episode. Please, questions, comments, concerns, uh, email us um, podcast thepodcast dot com or come in, please come to the turtle room dot com. Get in touch with us that way. Um, there's links and everything on there. Uh, you know, you know the drill. Please, um, we're looking forward to hearing from you. We love and feedback. We do. We love feedback, but not the kind. When your microphone's too close to the thing. All right, here comes the bug. Goodbye. <laughs> there it is. <laughs>